Hello, Ryan here, and welcome to Star Citizen Sunday. This is a weekly show which covers all of the news from the week just past. Be sure to subscribe if you like what you see, and let's get on with it. This week, we learn more about the Consolidated Outland Hover Quad. We get the latest on all things graphics, performance, Gen 12, and Vulcan. Plus, we take a look at how the latest profession being ship-to-ship -ship refueling will work when it releases in the next patch, Alpha 317. So Inside Star Citizen this week kicked off looking at the upcoming refueling gameplay loop. Now they want to try and bring players together with a lot of these mechanics and refueling is another support career that will be very important to the PU. Right now we can slowly get fuel just by flying around, which is now not the plan for all ships, only certain ships that have that functionality. So ships like basic fighters will lose that option and I think it'll be more role specific ships that will determine this. Obviously, small fighters that are designed for combat purposes are going to lose this and need to rely on support craft, which will make operations require a lot more thought and planning. Now, for the first iteration of refueling, which is coming in 317, they do not have the beacon option set up for players to request fuel. It will rely on players asking in general chat for someone with a staff error to come and refuel you. Now, of course, this does open many problems which I will get to in a second. But let's say that the player who responds has a Starfarer, they will then need to fly to any space station they say. I'm assuming any landing zone will allow as well, but that wasn't specified. And for the Starfarer, instead of buying and filling up its own fuel tanks, it will be choosing the specific fuel pods that they want to fill up with either quantum fuel or hydrogen fuel. They have also updated the current ship maintenance app, so you will have extra controls to decide what you want and once you have the fuel that you want the Starfarer crew can then set the prices for both fuel types that players will have to pay. Now once the Starfarer arrives at the location of the player in need of fuel they must dock together which uses the same process as ship to ship docking but via a boom arm and once docked they will use the same Mobiglass app to request what fuel they want and how much they want of it. Now this whole process will use an escrow service that'll basically take the money as the fuel is being provided. So if either ship needs to break the refueling process for whatever reason, whatever fuel has been taken by the ship is paid for, but nothing more. Which is a great idea as this will stop either parties firstly trying to scam each other or in case of a pirate attack you can just kind of break the process and get out of there ASAP. Now for the Starfarer crew, whenever a fuel request is accepted, the crew needs to open up the Starfarer's pods using this screen, this management screen, which as we have heard is just using one of the Starfarer's MFDs located at the back of the bridge, so it can be its own dedicated station. Uh, I do hope that we will be able to use one of the MFDs on the sort of gangway out the back. It wasn't specified and maybe it won't be for the first iteration, but hopefully long term it will. Uh, and this is where you will be able to then transfer the fuel. Now it looks like the process involves you choosing which pod you want to use based on the fuel you have inside, opening up the flow to that pod and then controlling the fuel flow rate using this kind of simple slider. However, there are safe rates of flow and if you go above these, then the more chance that something bad could happen. But the quicker the transfer rate, the quicker the fuel will transfer over. Now I love how it shows you the cost and estimated duration of the transfer in real time based on the nozzle flow rate, which is a nice touch. Now the ship that you are refueling will only take on as much fuel as they requested, so if you keep the flow going after they have had their fill, that fuel will just be ejected into space, so you must pay attention and the skill will be managing the speed and the safety of the transfer. And once the ship is full, the ship can undock and the job is done. So right now they are just iterating on the UI for the process as they want it to be as understandable and accessible for everyone as possible. Now they say that as the verse expands to new systems, they don't want Star Citizen to be too easy where fuel is always just available everywhere. We may find ourselves in systems where there is nowhere to get fuel or the nearest supply is extremely far away and they want this kind of gameplay to be thought about as you are planning your trips. So there is quite a lot to go through here and personally I really like how this is shaping up and I'm excited to get testing and learning about it when it drops in uh, 3.17 with my org. Of course the first iteration will have its flaws I'm sure but I think this is likely to be one of those mechanics like the medical mechanic that for most 
they would probably just prefer to respawn instead of awaiting a refuel, especially if you are relying on global chat, which will most certainly lead to a lot of players setting traps, especially if selling loot is available in 317 as well. But ultimately, this mechanic will be needed for when Pyro is here, as that system is practically three times the size of Stanton, and fuel supplies will be not as common. And eventually, we will have the option for the refuel beacon, as well as many more updates to security measures and such that will make it more viable. Now, I am definitely grateful that we are getting a, another new mechanic for 317, and I plan to get thoroughly stuck in and learn all of its ins and outs, hoping to teach all my other org members. And thankfully, in an org, we can test this relatively safely because we don't have to rely on randoms. Now, resource management and logistics will be one of the most important things to consider in Star Citizen, and getting this in now will be great fun and give CIG time to bug fix, tune, and balance for when Pyro does come along. Now, next up, we took a look at the Consolidated Outland Hover Quad, which was released in 316.1. It is an all-terrain vehicle that basically swaps out its weaponry and shielding for storage and better terrain handling, intended more for planetside exploration. It has an inventory that will allow players to store things. It is able to traverse over more rockier surfaces, better than the other two current vehicles or Gravler vehicles we have in game right now. And it was originally designed back when the Nomad was designed and was planned to be kind of carried by the Nomad. Now, personally, I actually really like that they are looking more into expanding in other areas of vehicles beyond combat. And I like the fact that we will have a, a ground vehicle that will be more optimal for planetside traversal and exploration. Allowing you to take supplies or store any items that you find is going to be quite fun. And although it doesn't have a lot of need right now, as the game expands, I'm sure it will. But that said, on pure aesthetics, I still do prefer my Drake Dragonfly, but I am more and more interested in owning one of these, which may come in handy for maybe exploring and looting the wrecks, or even just zooming down into a cave, which I never even considered doing. Anyway, we are still yet to see this available to buy, and I can imagine it won't be too long now until we do, but this will certainly become a new LTI token, and I'll probably end up buying one in-game. Uh, just to use rather than with real cash. But that was Inside Star Citizen. Let us move on. So this week's Star Citizen Live was talking all about graphics and graphics engineering in Star Citizen. The first question was, can we have a status update on Vulcan, the Vulcan API? So Vulcan, they say, is to be the new backend of the Star Citizen renderer, which they have named Gen 12. The progress on Vulcan is going very well, but it is limited by the progress on the Gen 12 renderer and cannot be completed until the Gen 12 renderer is complete itself. At the moment, as they have been developing the renderer, as soon as something new works within the renderer, they get that working with Vulcan 2 to keep it up to speed. But it always lags behind just a little bit, as you would expect. Now, in terms of features for Vulcan, they are about 75% complete but slightly less when you factor in performance as Vulcan will perform slightly different to the DirectX that they have been using in the past. So basically the first version of Vulcan probably won't run as fast as they would like and they will only ship the faster version once it's ready. So they are, they say around 60 to 75% depending on how much performance work it requires. But a lot of it has been done already. Now, once they finish the Gen 12 work, which is not far off now, they say they will then move more devs onto the Vulcan aspect to get that done pretty quickly. So they're not expecting a long release window between Gen 12 and Vulcan. Now, the next question was, how will Gen 12 be rolling out? Will it be like a light switch where everything is done or will it transition over time? And it will transition over time. It is already rolling out. We got some in, I think it was, was it 314 or 315? And it will continue to roll out with each patch as more parts of the game get converted to Gen 12. All of the post effects are now converted and they are now currently getting all the geometry done, which is pretty much the biggest part of the game. And right now on their internal build, they have all the opaque geometry done, which is the vast majority of the game with shadows coming straight after. And the shadows conversion is basically done now. They're just waiting on some testing. 
Now the big bits that are left are just to deal with transparent geometry and then some miscellaneous effects. So the largest parts have been tackled and the bulk of it is done and won't be much longer. And they say that every release that we have from now on, we will see more and more converted over to Gen 12. And as it does, we will all start seeing various benefits to one another, as it is very much dependable on the hardware of everybody's PC. So some unlucky person out there may not see any benefit from Gen 12, whereas others, he says, may see their frame rates triple. Of course, these are like the extremes. I'm assuming the majority of us will have some average in the middle somewhere. Now, the biggest performance wins will come more towards the end. And of course, the biggest change will be the more binary switch to Vulcan. So quite interesting to hear about the performance updates that we're going to get from this. Hopefully, I'm one of these lucky ones that will see triple frame rates. Uh, again, I doubt it. I think I'm going to be more average. But it is quite amazing to hear how they are progressing. And it does sound like throughout this year, starting with 317, I hope, we will start to see more and more of Gen 12 roll out hopefully bringing more and more performance improvements. So excellent news there. Next question, will the game always be so CPU intensive or will it ever be more GPU intensive? Now they say the goal of the Gen 12 conversion is to remove a chunk of the CPU work over to the GPU, which will make it more evenly spread. But even if there was no CPU work from the graphics department, the rest of the game is still very big and very complicated. However, there is a lot of other work going on by other teams to help reduce the CPU load. So it's going to be kind of an ongoing thing to improve performance. And the graphics team specifically do want to move the game to be more GPU bound, which means they can then push the GPU effects much harder for those who can handle it and then scale it for those with less powerful GPUs. But it will always have a pretty significant CPU load as it is. Next question, are you expecting to look further into the mesh shader pipeline? And they do want to look into them, but due to the low adoption rate, which is approximately about, he says about 30% of users, it's not a priority, but that should grow over time and they will need to look into it more uh, when the time is right. Next question, has there been any internal testing of Linux with Vulkan? And they say, although it's not a focus, switching to Vulkan should make running it on Linux much faster and give comparable or even better performance. However, it's more of a question for someone else, not the graphics guy. The next question is, how will Star Citizen stay graphically relevant? Now, they say it's not hugely different to any other AAA studio, as they all have to do this throughout the game's development. And so they will continue to just replace the old effects with the new effects, which is not too much difference to what other studios do. Obviously, we don't hear about it because we're not watching it happen and unfold with open development. Now, they do make everything backwards compatible and will apply everything new to the game as they go. Uh, and the next question kind of follows on. Will Star Citizen get outdated or surpassed by other engines like Unreal 5, for example? And they say there is always a new engine coming around and everyone will learn from it and trial the tech. And if it's a success, other studios will make their own versions of that specific tech. It's just how the industry works. And as long as Star Citizen is maintaining their engine, it will keep up with all of the cutting edge tech. Uh, there are still areas that they want to improve now and they will as time goes on. Next question is, does the Star Citizen engine have a limit to where it can no longer be improved? And they say, no, it's more the opposite. Now, the engine is made up of many different subsystems that can be constantly iterated on or replaced, which is just how the natural evolution of software and game engines kind of goes. So they are now accelerating the engine very quickly, like the replacement of the renderer, for example, to make it 100% Star Citizen's own. So they know everything about it. They know exactly how it works and how they want it to be, which will allow them to scale things much quicker and keep up with all this new tech. After this conversion, the rate at which they can keep up with the new tech will increase, which is one of the biggest benefits of adopting this new renderer, which will allow them to adapt to new tech and create new features much more quickly. So great to hear someone finally kind of explain this thoroughly, as this does come up quite often. A lot of people saying by the time the game releases, the graphics will be outdated and so on. But this clearly shows that it won't and it will be able to keep up with all of the AAA games as they release. Now, next question, will we have more refined graphics settings anytime soon? 
And they say, yes, but they have been holding off on this for a while as it is not so GPU bound yet. Once the Gen 12 renderer is implemented, it will allow them to expand these options with much more complicated settings available. They also want to push the memory management as well, which we will speak about in a second. Next question is kind of simply resolution scaling is, you know, what's going to happen here. And he says it is a bit of an embarrassment that they have not addressed this properly yet, but it will be possible once Gen 12 is done and it is one of their priorities. And the same kind of goes for the next question, which is, will Star Citizen ever support native HDR? And again, absolutely, they want to do this. They have a couple of things left to do, like the color processing being one and then making sure that all HDR types are catered for. And just like with resolution scaling, once Gen 12 is in, this is one of the priorities they want to get done, which is excellent news because I do have a HDR monitor. Next question, will you add more blur options like object based instead of camera motion based? And yes, they will. Will VRAM requirements keep increasing as the game develops? Now, they said that about 4 gig VRAM should be enough for quite some time as a minimum, and they don't see the minimum uh, requirements for VRAM increasing anytime soon. But once they have Gen 12, they do plan to expose more options to players to choose how they distribute their VRAM, like we see in a lot of modern games now, which will be very nice, especially as a lot of graphics cards are now really skyrocketing with more VRAM. Next question, how do you plan to handle the graphical toll when more players are able to be in one area of space at a time? Now, it will be more a CPU cost, but Gen 12 is one solution to alleviate the pressure. But ultimately, they it'll all come down to optimizing as they go from the graphics teams as well as all the other teams doing their own optimizations. Next question, will we ever see practical night vision? Now, he can't promise anything because it's very much a game design thing. But from the graphics standpoint, most games just adjust screen brightness and have like a green filter and so on. Call of Duty Modern Warfare did emulate night vision a lot more realistically. So converting the colors to what they would look like through an IR camera. And so CIG, he says, would certainly want to do it properly rather than simply, which is one of the things that I love about CIG. They do things properly. Of course, this does mean a lot of things take a long time to get done. However, I personally prefer this approach because it does make you appreciate the feature a lot more, even if we are waiting for it. And I can just imagine how cool night vision will be in Star Citizen, and having to buy a device to wear, maybe part of a helmet feature or just goggles and scopes and whatnot. I think it would be done so well by CIG. Now, next question, what are the tech limitations for clouds producing noise? Uh, and they say clouds are built in stages and each have been researched and developed to find the best way. They have looked into ways to reduce noise and have found a good solution, which should optimize it as well as improve the quality. He has no idea when it will be implemented for us, but it is coming. Next question, does RTX get the team closer to the lack of reflective surfaces? And they say yes and no. So for a true mirror-like surface, ray tracing is currently the only real option. They may consider having a different process for things like water or a single mirror reflection, but ultimately for full reflection on all surfaces like ships, for example, ray tracing is the only option. It was mentioned a while back during a Star Citizen Live, I think for from the lighting team, that the Lumberyard engine does have its own version of ray tracing. So it won't likely be RTX, which is NVIDIA's own version of ray tracing, but more what is available to them through the engine where everyone can benefit. The next question is, will the game ever get realistic snow weather that doesn't look like just dust storms with a different texture? And they say the tech is there for particles to be different, whether they are different or not, he doesn't know, but the wind volumes do realistically kick up what is on the ground for each environment now. And so if it's snow, it'll be snow that gets kicked up. The plan to get proper snow and actually all weather types is there. They do plan to do this and they are all very excited to get on with it. There are no dates for this or when to expect it, but I know last we heard was once they get clouds to a point where they're happy with them, then we will start to see weather expand from all the other teams. Next question is simply DLSS and FSR. What is the plan? And they say both of these do aim to do a similar thing, but the way that they are implemented is entirely different. Now, one issue is much of Star Citizen's UI is in the game 
and this scaling process does not support that. So they will need to look at it further before they delve into it. But it is not a question of A versus B. It's more based on their own independent merits. Can they implement it? How long will it take? And so on and so forth. Next question, will we ever see HUD visibility improvements? And they say, yes, the UI team will also have a hand in this too, but they have done a few shader changes like drop shadows, dynamic brightening, new bloom and blur effects, and so on and so forth, which they have in the works and they are planning to integrate some of this into the pipeline for the UI team soon. What graphical improvements are you personally excited for? Which is asked to Ali Brown, the guy uh, on the show today. And he says his main aim is to make the FPS in Star Citizen a solid 60. Uh, and once he hits a solid 60 FPS, then that excitement may change. And he said global illumination is kind of his second thing. But the final question is, you know, how do we get to 60 FPS average? Now, Gen 12, again, is the first point of this. So it's clear that the Gen 12 render is a huge importance here, which will then optimize the CPU. Then immediately over to GPU optimizations, he says, once they've got Gen 12 done, and then the rest of the engine code, which is kind of out of his hands. Now, there is a lot more optimizations and improvements from many of the teams, and there is not one thing to do here or one team to get to that point. It takes almost all teams to get these goals, but Ali is adamant to get the average FPS for most people to 60 FPS. And I am very glad to hear that this is priority. I think it'll be great to get to that without needing a monster PC. So having an average PC, a mid-range PC, should be reaching the 60 frames and then the variations either side. He did say more debug stats will come for us to see more clearly what is going on on our own machines and whether there is something that we can do to improve it. So there we have it. Quite a great insight into the things that are going on. Clearly Gen 12 is top priority and hugely important. And it will be very interesting to see just how the performance improves from patch to patch as they roll this out. Then it's on to Vulkan and then it's more GPU stuff. I think it is safe to say that the performance and FPS will get better. And already we have seen great improvements to the FPS from previous patches. So I really appreciate that it'll get better. And here's hoping that 3.17 will see some of this at the end of March. So also this week, Jumptown stats were revealed. We had a new tracker post in which the host speaks to an old friend about bounty hunting in the pyro system. Both Squadron 42 and the PU monthly reports were released for January. These are available to read and I have already covered the Squadron 42 report, which I will link below with the PU report coming early this week. The roadmap was also updated last week. Again, my video coverage can be found in the description below. And finally, Xenothreat returned to Stanton and we had three new posts on Spectrum to help get players prepared for what to expect. I had a great time last night with my org taking them on, but I'm not sure how long this event lasts. It could be finishing today, it could be extending throughout the week. I don't know. If anyone does know, please do drop a comment below. So that brings us to the end of the show. If you do enjoy my content, please consider subscribing and hitting that like button. Also, I am able to do this thanks to my very generous patrons and channel members. If you appreciate what I do and would like to help make it even better from as little as $1 a month, all of the links are provided below.